and how do you get that much stuff done and still manage to shove in parenting, having a wife and working out. I believe in delegation with information. I have really good people at each of the three enterprises. I don't believe for a minute that you can run a business by hiring great people and just entirely getting out of their way. But I do think if you hire great people, you align economic incentives and you stay fully informed and then get out of the way. It really, it actually really can work. And that is typically how I try to approach it. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Welcome to another Walker Webcast. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce this week's Walker Webcast, which is a discussion between Walker and Dunlop board member and McKinsey partner, Gary Pincus, and Take Two Interactive chairman and CEO, Strauss Zelnick. This interview and discussion was taped at the Walker and Dunlop Summer Conference uh, in July of 2024 um, and is our annual client event that we hold in Sun Valley a little bit similar to the Allen and Company Media Conference, which always comes the week before us, where the world's billionaires in media and technology come together. Walker and Dunlop has um, attempted to emulate the Allen and Company Conference, where we bring in some of the largest and most influential investors in commercial real estate from across the country to not only discuss our industry trends, but also broader trends such as leadership, such as governance, such as sport such as media, as you'll now hear from Strauss and Gary in a moment. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to engage with our clients um, and to not only focus on commercial real estate, but the broader issues that make all of our lives go and spin and work and hopefully be productive and hopefully be enjoyable, um, as well as issues that are important to all of us as we operate inside and outside of our businesses um, to grow them to make them profitable, to attract great talent. Um, and Gary and Strauss are both such successful businessmen that this conversation between the two of them really covers a lot of ground. Um, one of the areas that it also covers that's very, super important to Strauss is physical fitness and health. Strauss is probably the fittest public company CEO um, you will either either meet or watch on a video camera. And the way that Strauss prioritizes physical health um, is quite something given how successful he is as a businessman um, and then also how fit he is as a human being. Um, it'd be interesting to ask Strauss how long he intends to live because at the at 66 years old, he certainly has many, many years to come. It's a pleasure for us to host the Walker webcast every week. It's also a pleasure for me to sort of take a week off and play a replay of a very engaging conversation from our Sun Valley Summer Conference. I hope you enjoy the discussion between Gary and Strauss. Thanks very much, as always, for listening to the Walker webcast, and I hope you enjoy the tape. It, as I think about the multiple things you do, uh, both personally and professionally, it's a pretty stunning list. It feels like you've either invented more hours in the day or come up with a personal operating model that allows you to do things at a different level than the rest of us. Maybe talk a little bit about that. How do you just think about organizing your time? How do you get that much stuff done and still manage to shove in parenting, having a wife and working out? Well, I, I mean, uh, most of the time, uh, totally inadequately, right? I mean, you know, you fall short, uh, uh, from a self-assessment point of view, uh, at any given time, if you're, if you're honest about it, I appreciate the introduction. Um, before we get into mm. and I will answer your question. It is, um, it's always a pleasure to follow Willie Walker and be the warm up act for Barry Sternlicht. So thank you for putting us in this slot. Uh, <laughs> really appreciate that. I also, I mean, I am allergic to the, the intro. I mean, it's so flattering to have an introduction like that, but it's sort of a little off-putting because, of course, you know, you just peel back the surface and everything is not quite as shiny as it sounds or looks. So um, the, the true answer is like, first of all, I don't advise anyone to do three things at the same time. Certainly not when you start out. These things came upon me over time. So I started ZMC from scratch in 2001. We took over. So that that's what I was doing full time. That was it. Took over take two in 07. And it was a really small company then. It isn't now, but it was then. The market cap was 
about 700 million. Um, revenue was about 700 million. And it was just another portfolio company for, for ZMC. We did not expect it to grow into what it grew into. And it took a long time. So it wasn't like I started with, you know, Z- and then the family business uh, just came my way when my father-in-law passed away, which was in uh, 2016. So at that point, ZMC was pretty mature. Take Two was pretty mature. And I was able to turn my attention at least partially to a third thing. So uh, that's that's how it works. The other reason I think it works is that I believe in delegation with information. I have really good people at each of the three enterprises. I don't believe for a minute that um, y- you can run a business by hiring great people and just entirely getting out of their way. But I do think if you hire great people, you align economic incentives and you stay fully informed and then get out of the way. It really, it actually really can work. And that is typically how I try to approach it. On that last point, Trust, when you say fully informed, do you have a set of metrics that you expect to get on a daily basis, weekly basis? My, what's sort of the operating rhythm for those three? It's things? weekly. And actually, I think this is, this is a question I'm often posed by people I'm, I'm trying to coach, which is another thing that I actually spend a lot of time on, which is how do you interact with your teams? Um, I don't really do one-on-ones because I've just too many colleagues. I've got about at last count, about 17,500 people in the system. So uh, it's not realistic to do one-on-ones, but I also don't think it's necessarily the best thing for an organization for the CEO to do one-on-ones as a matter of management. So the way we do it at the Take Two at ZMC is we have a weekly meeting of the senior team, and I mean the really senior team. So Take Two is a a $30 billion company with five and a half billion in revenue and 12 and a half thousand people. The senior team's 14 people. We meet Tuesday mornings at 11 o'clock. And the rule of the meeting is you got to bring everything to the meeting that matters, and there's no filter. Uh, And that is effectively the one-on-one. So if someone says to me after the meeting, hey, I didn't want to say this in the meeting. I had to talk to you personally. Uh, You've all heard that. Um, My response is, if it's personal, of course, if it's about business, you got to bring it to the meeting. We do that in the meeting. And we do the same thing at ZMC. So everything's on the table. And obviously, the, there may be follow-up meetings, but that's kind of level setting in terms of where we are and where we hope to go, both for the week and, and, and for, for longer. And at, at Bellsburg, where I'm not quite as intimately involved, I get a weekly written update from the key team mm-hmm. members. And then I, I read it on Friday nights, even if it's late, and I respond 100% of the time to the team. And then if we need to have meetings, we have meetings. So I'm, I'm able to, comp- I was talking to a young CEO who's got a, actually a real estate business and his hair was on fire, He'd like, you know, a wife and a little kid. And I, he had no time for anything. And he was working from like five in the morning to 11 at night. And I said, so tell me like, what are you populating your day with? And he was like, well, I have, I have 25 one-on-ones. I was like, that's your week. That's, that's 24, five hours. How about if you do this? How about one, one hour meeting with 25 people? Let's try that. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. You touched on something a second ago, Stress. You talked about being CEO at 29. It actually, for me, at least begs the, the question, since few of us have had that opportunity, maybe if you don't mind being a bit personal for a moment, go back to what I'll call the Strauss-Zelnick origin story, uh, uh-huh. as, they call, as they call it in the comic business. How did you, wh- where and how did you grow up? What, what, what sort of got you? Know, I, I didn't touch on this in the intro, but Strauss has, has had a number of CEO positions in the media industry. Uh, including also board positions. He was chair of the board of CBS. I mean, at a very young age, Strauss was the Wunderkind, if I could pronounce that right, of the, uh, of the media industry. Go back further. Where, wh- wh- where did you get started? What did you know from the moment you were five years old that that was what you wanted to do? How did you get to where you were and maybe where you are now? Um, yeah, I don't know that there's anything more pathetic than being an old guy dining out on your youthful success, but uh, I'm... I'll put that to the side. Uh, so I, uh, I grew up in Boston. My dad was a lawyer. And um, for some reason, I wanted to uh, run a movie company when I was five years old. And it was made no sense because we weren't in the family had no exposure to the entertainment business. And I wasn't even allowed to watch television or go to the movies. 
And the first movie I ever saw was Disney's Fantasia, which both scared and bored me. Um, but nonetheless, I was, I decided that that was what I wanted to do. Um, family moved to New Jersey. Um, and, uh, that wasn't the worst of it, although that was bad, but, um, and, uh, and, um, I just maintained an interest in entertainment. Like many people in the entertainment business, I, I toyed with the notion of being a performer. Um, but I didn't, I, I was a singer songwriter, but had, um, not much talent. Luckily, I realized that before it's too late. Otherwise, I'd be, I was just good enough that right now, if I hadn't recognized that, I'd be playing weddings and bar mitzvahs. So it's good that I did recognize that and gave that up. And then I became a writer. I was a better writer than I was a singer songwriter. Um, but I still wasn't good enough to be a professional writer and I didn't like it enough. And so having toyed with the notion of being a creative person, I, I thought, well, you know, this original ambition of actually running a business in the creative, space would be more interesting. Um, I went to Wesleyan undergrad uh, because I didn't get into Harvard undergrad. Uh, and um, that was deeply depressing to me. It was like a fulcrum moment in my life because my family had been, been going to Harvard since the dark ages. And I was like the first one not to get in. And I thought I was going to get in. I was really shocked that I didn't get in. My advisors at school were not at all shocked because they actually had looked at my SAT scores <laughs> um, and my grades. But, you know, I, 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 in any case, I went to Wesleyan because I was so upset that I hadn't gotten this thing I wanted. It actually motivated me to do well for the first time in my life. And I did do well at Wesleyan, well enough that I went to Harvard uh, out of uh, undergrad to uh, business school and law school at the same time. That was kind of a little, you know, Harvard, I thought, because like, so I'll show you, I'll go to both schools um, as if they cared. And um, and then uh, I, I really, I, I had no, I still like no way to get into the entertainment business. Um, but I got, it's very lucky, um, a friend of my uh, a dad's, not a close friend, just a casual friend, was making movies it was like this a long time ago. I was making tax shelter movies, if you remember that bad tax shelter movies, but he was in the movie business. He had a friend who was at Viacom, which at that time was a tiny little company, public company that spun out of CBS, actually, right. and leaned on the head of business affairs to give me a summer job after my first year in law school. And it was that summer job at Viacom um, that actually led to my first job in, in the entertainment business was, that was at Columbia Pictures when I graduated I was responsible for uh, licensing international television programming to international markets, which gave me some sales skills. And I was recruited from there to go to Vestron, which was the largest independent home entertainment company that wanted to start a movie company. Uh, and I went over there. I was now, I think, 28. I graduated at 26. And for no good reason, they made me president of that company. Um, about nine months later, which was a public company. And I, I thankfully had the presence of mind to understand like this was really kind of a cool thing that, um, but I'm completely and totally not ready for this job. Uh, so I, I ran scared, started a movie division for them. And the first picture I greenlit oddly became the highest grossing independent film of all time, which was good for my career. And um, actually got me the job as president of 20th Century Fox. I mean, the name? Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Willie actually gave us an agenda, which so far I've successfully ignored, but I should probably <laughs> jump back on it. Let's talk a little about gaming. Um, uh, I remember over dinner, I uh, once stress, I think at Willie's house, you gave me some statistic, which I'm going to ask you to quote for the group, about the size of the gaming industry relative to TV. Uh, and all of the other sort of components of media. I'm assuming that's part of what, what drew you to it. Uh, but talk a little bit. I still have this image of gaining uh, from my youth of me sitting in front of a Atari machine, playing mostly by myself, maybe with my brother, if I was in the right mood. I think it's different now. Uh, give us a sense of, of what's it's happening different. in the industry. Well, look, I mean, it sort of picks up where I left off. I was, um, so I was head of Fox for four years. So I'd been in the movie business successfully for seven years. And, um, there's a great Buffett aphorism, which I'll butcher, which was if you take a bad business and a good management team over time, it is the business's reputation that will remain intact. And I realized like 
the motion picture business was just a bad business. And I don't mean bad, like unpleasant because it was fun. I mean, the underlying economics were terrible. So I was at Fox um, and trying to figure out whether I was really going to dig in and stay in the movie business and um, or do something else. And I thought what I really want to do is, first of all, something more entrepreneurial. But also what I really want is to work in the movie business of 1927, not the movie business of 2000. So what's the movie business of 1927? I was like, it's a video game business. Now, at that time, it was a tiny little business. Mm -hmm. um, and I simultaneously with arriving at that conclusion, oddly, I was called by a headhunter and I was recruited to join a pre-revenue startup in, in the video game space. So, um, and I did, I, you're looking at the only human being who's ever voluntarily left the job of president of a major film studio, uh, who's taken a 95% pay cut, sold his fancy house in Beverly Hills at a huge loss and moved his young family to Silicon Valley. But I did. And, um, you know, that was, that was actually 1993. Boy. So it was a really long time ago. And I was betting that the video game business would become the largest entertainment business. Um, and thankfully I was right about that. Um, so where are we now? The, the video game business is bigger than any other entertainment business, about $180 billion a year business. Um, if you combine, uh, linear television with streaming, actually to all forms of television are bigger than video games, okay. uh, for now, but not by much. And vastly bigger than music, which is a $30 billion business, vastly bigger than books, which is a $70 billion-ish business. So it's a massive industry, and it's America's pastime. Hundreds of millions of Americans play video games. And interestingly, to your point about like who's actually playing them, the average age of a video game player is 37, and the skew male to female is about 55% male, 45% female. Or said another way, because this this you would think this audience is like completely... Uh, a devoid of gamers. How many of you play video games, mobile or console? Raise your hand. So actually, it is pretty small. I'm surprised that there's no, not. No, there's mobile. more hands going up over here. I but, just saw they were a little so, skittish to put their hands up. But but but, but actually, um, most um, you know most uh, women actually uh, over the age of around 35 do play some mobile games. So it's un unusual that there are fewer hands here. Um, but you know, people think of like, is this male dominated? It's like, well, actually, no, um, most, most women play video games. And, and it's social now, if I understand my it's vision of a, of the adolescent male is actually not the, 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 it's clearly not demographically right. Well, I mean, how many of you, I'll try again. How many of you have teenage kids? Okay. So you, your teenage kids do have headsets on, are playing video games and are talking to their remote friends when they're playing video games. And they're not in the basement. They're in the family room. Uh, and generally, they have friends around when they're doing that. I'm going to shift to another of the topics I promised Willie we'd cover. And it does tie back to gaming. But artificial intelligence uh, came up in a number of the conversations uh, yesterday. I, um, I wasn't sure if I was excited or terrified when uh, uh, Muhammad yesterday said chat GPT-5, I think his phrase was, is unbelievable. Because I thought GPT-4 was pretty unbelievable. And so you guys have been working with artificial intelligence in some form for probably longer than almost any other industry. And even Willie mentioned art AI goes back 70 years, uh, longer than the internet, actually. Talk to us a little bit about how you've worked with it historically, and then is the new generative AI fundamentally different uh, for the gaming industry, or you, know, you can even take it to the world at large. So the first thing is remember AI, artificial intelligence is an oxymoron, uh, as is machine learning. There is no su such thing as artificial intelligence and machines don't learn, right? These are, well, what you're dealing with is computations and algorithms, right? And what generative AI is, is a combination of rich data sets, uh, compute and large language models. And for us, those of us who haven't been exposed to generative AI until recently, I mean, it's a pretty cool looking parlor trick. Um, but it is a parlor trick. It's just a super fancy parlor trick. So um, for the people who are telling you that machines through generative AI are going to become sentient, take over the world, become evil, and enslave us all, put your mind at ease. That's not going to happen. Uh, ultimately, they are machines, or as the head of... Um, Boston uh, Dynamics, a robotics company, said at a conference I was at, we do intentionally make these things with an off switch. 
Uh, so they're, they're machines, and these machines are pretty extraordinary. But you're right, since the dawn of the video game business, we've been using what is now known as artificial intelligence, which essentially is just you know the ability to create uh, material inside a computer and make it look real. Um, that's what we're doing. Generative AI is, is, is cool for us, but is it really that much cooler than when you and I first used the internet? A really long time ago, and we could actually make a query, a, you know, a, a natural English language query, and get a response. Um, that was pretty cool then too. And this generation of young people will see generative AI as just, you know, table stakes as it is. Um, it does not replace um, human intelligence, a- and won't. Um, I love the fact that people are like, "Well, you know, ChatGPT can ace the LSAT." It's like, okay, I mean. Computers have been beating human beings at chess for a long time. It's just the same thing. But the LSAT, we we don't, I don't know how many trained lawyers there are here. The LSAT doesn't mean that you can be a practicing lawyer. Like, I sadly have to hire litigators now and then. Like, I don't call up and say, what was your LSAT score? <laughs> you know, I, I want to know what cases that person won or lost. Um, so, chat GPT will, will provide all kinds of work that previously was human work. And that is the history of, that is the story of the industrial revolution to begin with and, and the history of computers. And yes, it, it's embedded in the video game business. Probably the best example for the 14 people here who play video games is it's, if you, um, if you play video games now, you know, there's dialogue in the video games. And the way we create dialogue in a video game is we actually have human beings write it and then record it, and they record like 10,000 lines of dialogue. And then when you get into the game, we have artificial intelligence. It has this tree and branch system. So it feels natural to you as you're hearing this pre-recorded dialogue. As you can understand from what I just told you, that's a very cumbersome and expensive system. We're soon going to be able to train models inside our video games on the storyline and on the characters, but then have the dialogue be generated on the fly in a natural way, so that if Gary plays a game and I play the game, we have totally different experiences. But the dialogue that exists, which wasn't actually written by human beings, which was generated by the by the model, will feel really, really natural. Now, we're not there yet, but we will get there. Finally, for those of how many of you are worried that I'd love to see the answer to this? How many of you are worried that AI is going to um, uh, cause you to be unemployed? Well, I'm retiring, so I'm less worried about <laughs> so, that. You already have religion on this topic, clearly. Um, that it's interesting, not one hand went up. But this is like an enormous fear. And when I speak publicly on the topic, like people angrily say, you know, AI is gonna is gonna destroy employment. And what I remind people of is look, you know, just the, the short phrase, which is the industrial revolution and the advent of computer technology vastly increased employment did not decrease employment. Now I'll give you a specific question. I'm, I'm sitting here with a McKinsey consultant. So the, I'm going to have, I'm just going to ask you, Gary. Uh, 150 years ago, what percent of the U.S. workforce was engaged in agriculture? 80%, I think. It's about 65 or 70, but you're very close. Um, and uh, today, uh, we now feed all of America with our agriculture and most of the world uh, with our agricultural exports. What percent of the U.S. workforce is engaged in agriculture, which is to say farming? I think less than 10. Two, two percent. I have yet to run into anyone, I've been around for a long time, who has said to me, it's terrible, I cannot get a job as a farmer. So that's what's going to happen with, with generative AI. The jobs that are being taken away are the jobs you do not want. And the jobs that you all do here, you all realize is that you you all do not get paid for doing Excel spreadsheets. You may do them, but that's not how you get paid. You get paid for making really good and hard decisions, typically about making investments and managing investments and mitigating risk. Um, there's no machine that's going to make that decision for you effectively. Why? Because if you all had that machine, you'd all have the same technology and you wouldn't be able to trade assets or buy assets or sell assets by definition. You're going to have to take your human intelligence and rise above that. Right now, many of you do use common systems that actually make investing and managing real estate more effective. 
Um, but you don't use those systems to make the decision for you. And generative AI is not going to do that for you either. Well, let's use that maybe to jump to this question of investments. This is an audience that has uh, probably got more than uh, the average uh, consumer's interest in things like interest rates, the macro economy, where people are investing. Uh, maybe open-ended questions, stress, points of view on uh, not necessarily interest rates in the macro economy, although I'm open to that too, But because we talked about that a fair bit with Mohammed yesterday. But mm. what are you getting most excited about as an investor now? And if you with the real estate part of what you do? Is there particular areas you're more or less excited about? Well, I mean, it depends on how you define excited. Um, I'm scared. Uh, is, you know, I think it's been a pretty tough time for the past couple of years, and I am in commercial real estate, and that's been pretty brutal. Um, I, I, I'm an optimist also, and not an expert. My own view, though, is, for what it's worth, that things will continue to ease. I don't think, you know, the people now saying they're going to get three uh, 25 basis point rate cuts between now and year end. I don't see that personally. I think we may get one or two rate cuts. I wouldn't be surprised if we had a total of 50 bips by the end of the year. Um, I'd also, you know, note that in, you know, with all the shrieking around interest rates, the, Barry's talked a lot about this publicly. I'm sure he will again today. But the issue is really just how quickly the Fed changed interest rates, mm. not the actual level of interest rates. It was the shock to the system. And the fact that so many of us were, you know, deeply affected by that in ways that we just couldn't get out of quickly enough, um, more than the actual level. I mean, mortgage rates now for you, many of you are in the multi space around 6.9%. You know, my first mortgage when I graduated from school, I think was 16 or 17%. So, you know, in the fullness of time, I'm not sure rates are, are so egregious, although I do see them coming down, but it's the way that we got from free money to expensive money that caused all the upset that so many of us have had to deal with. And I do see that, I do say that beginning to ease in, in the next year or two, inflation is clearly coming down. And again, qu quoting Barry, if you actually um, untangle the statistics for inflation, which he's done before, um, and maybe we'll do it again, you know, in th the core inflation actually is, is lower than is being reported now. So we're, we're actually in a pretty good place. I, I think, Markets are a leading indicator and the S&P is a leading indicator of expectations that things are only getting better. So I, I was kind of hopeful that by the end of 24, we'd be in a better place than I think we will be in. But I think as we head into 25, mid-25, we'll be in a pretty good place. But you touched on something interesting there because I, I share that same perspective, which is by the historical standards, if you go back 20 plus years, we're not at a particularly high interest rate environment. And yet the real estate industry could thrive in that environment. And in fact, all industry could, you know, as long as we weren't moving too dramatically. Right. It's way, the reset that's problematic. I mean, again, reset is a fancy way of saying like losing buildings. I mean, it's, it is, it is a problem. Um, but it's a problem that we will get through. And depending on how you organized your life, which is to say what your appetite for leverage was, you're either in a better or worse place.